Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, now the third chapter on our course on structural geology uh, in part one, Structures in the Ductile Field. We are going to talk about shear sense indicators and particularly uh, those in the ductile field, but also some of the semi brittle shear sense indicators we will cover here. Uh, here is the uh, one that you know from the second year course and also from the first year course, slick and sides. Slick and sides and slick and side steps are the most important shear sense indicator in the brittle field. Hard particles along the fault surface have left some grooves and striations on the fault surface, and that indicates the direction of movement. But uh, if we only have movement indicators, so the shear direction, we still don't know whether the missing block was moving in this direction or in that direction. This we can find out by investigating slick and side steps, and these steps are facing always in the direction in which the missing block, in this case the hanging wall block, has moved. The hanging wall block itself would have a shape that is just the negative shape of what we see here in the remaining non-eroded block. The linear fabric elements of the slick and lines indicate the shear direction. The slick and side steps, which are perpendicular to these lineations, indicate the shear sense. This also works if fluid phases were introduced during uh, formation of the fault and uh, fibrous quartz has grown. We see here fibrous quartz growth on a fault from the Cape Fault Belt and we see the slick and side steps are facing here to the left hand side and here we see the sun is shining on some of them. So a uniform left facing fiber line steps indicates that if this is our lineation here, and that is not really perfectly to see here, you see it a little bit. Uh, if the lineation is oriented like indicated here, then the missing hanging wall block would have moved to the left. In the brittle and semi-brittle field, we always will have a component of fracturing associated with the development of shear sense indicators. We have seen these slick inside steps. We also might find offset of markers if you have a uh, geological marker cross-cutting a fault surface and you can see in which direction and how far it has been uh, moved along a fault and of course such offset markers can be used as shear sense indicators in the brittle field and that also applies to the ductile field wherever you see such markers. En echelon tension gashes are now a characteristic shear sense indicator for the semi-brittle field for the brittle ductile transition because the evolution, as you will see, of national tension gashes has components of brittle failure, but also components of ductile failure. In this illustration here at the bottom, we see that uh, such national tension gashes can look a little bit different to each other. Here we see the initial stages of such uh, tension gashes, and important is that they are always occurring in shear zones that have some ductility them, so plasticity of the rock is higher than in areas where you have only faulting, but you also form fractures. These are the tension gashes, these oval shapes here. These would be gashes that propagate along their tips in this direction, vertical direction here in our pure shear zone, and uh, they would open up laterally if our pure shear zone is horizontal. Here we see an example of a non-coaxial, for instance, a simple shear zone, where the orientation of these national tension gashes is uh, oblique to the boundaries of the shear zone. And here we have a simple shear component that is in this example top to the right. Let's have a look at the strain axis. We see here the strain axis. S3 is the principal strain axis of maximum shortening and S1 is the principal strain axis of maximum stretch. So don't confuse these here with stress vectors, with sigma 1 and sigma 3. These are different things. This here describes the actual orientation of strain and not of the force that might be responsible for this strain. So here we see shortening is vertical, stretch is laterally, and that opens these veins parallel to the shear zone, and it propagates them in length vertically to the shear zone. If we would have some progressive strain in such a shear zone, in such a semi-brittle shear zone, we would find that these tension gashes are growing 
in the direction of their tips, of this top and bottom end, and they would uh, also grow in thickness laterally while they are opening parallel to S1. In principle, that is uh, similar in the non-coaxial, for instance, simple shear zones. Here we have the opening of these veins also in the direction of S3 at the initial stage, and we are opening them parallel to S1, the direction of maximum stretch. But we will observe that during progressive strain in such a shear zone, uh, the strain axes are rotating. They will be rotating in such a... Here we see an illustration of inertial tension gashes in the field. These tension gashes have a typical curving shape. You see here that what we call a sigmoidal shape of individual tension gashes, and they are arranged laterally to each other if you connect the centers of such uh, initial tension gashes. You will find the orientation of the semi-brittle shear zone, which is not necessarily a planar surface. The common mineralization in initial tension gashes is quartz, but uh, depending on what the fluid might have dissolved in it, you might also find carbonate tension gashes. You can find chloride, epidote, pyrite, and uh, a number of other minerals in such hydrothermal veins because these are, in fact, a hydrothermal fluid influx from which precipitation will occur. Here we see examples from the Cape Fold Belt. Uh, these are initial tension gashes in Devonian quartzites. And uh, you can see here the shapes of the surfaces connecting the centers of the initial tension gashes gives you usually some sort of uh, curving irregular surface geometry. When you look uh, closer in more detail, you see here the uh, long stretch out tips of the international tension gashes and thicker centers. And uh, here this typical curving sigmoidal shape of individual tension gashes. Here, this rotation and this curving shape is more intensely developed in this uh, example. You see it also on top here. So the centers are often a bit thicker here and here and here. We see that quite uh, beautifully. And uh, we see the uh, tips that are pointing in a uniform direction and the centers of the vein, which can be more or less intensely rotated. Here they are not very strongly rotated. Here they are rotated by uh, 150 degrees or something like that. Another example from uh, the same area in uh, the Cape Fold Belt with uh, a close association of many individual national tension gashes with uh, fairly thick centers that have almost merged to a complete coherent uh, semi-brittle shear zone with the tips still sticking out, pointing in a uniform direction to the top left or bottom right here. How do such energy tension gashes form? In the next series of uh, illustrations, we will see how they initially look like and how they evolve uh, during progressive strain. Again, we have a top to the right simple shear component of deformation in this example. And uh, the stress field is illustrated here. Now, these are stress vectors. And you will see the stress vectors are not going to change over time in the evolution of such a shear zone. Sigma 1, top left, bottom right, and sigma 3, perpendicular to it, top right, bottom left. What initially happens is we form tensile fractures supported by the influx of uh, hydrothermal fluid. So we have hydraulic fractures here, which uh, indicate a high pore fluid pressure. And these tensile fractures form, as we know, parallel to sigma 1, and they open up parallel to sigma 3. Here we get our first set of initial tension gashes, just oval, long, stretched gashes with the tips pointing in sigma 1 direction. If we carry on with progressive strain, and you see here the top block slowly moves by ductile failure to the right-hand side, while our brittle structures uh, keep on growing and propagating. We see that here our first set that uh, looked like uh, this simple geometry here in its initial state starts to rotate while it is growing in size. 
and it's growing in size in its oldest part, which is the centers of these veins. And uh, the tips of these veins keep on propagating and because these are initially uh, mold one fractures, they are propagating in the direction of sigma one. That means sigma one is still top left, bottom right. Because of the ductile strain that occurs along the semi-brittle shear zone, the older parts of the vein are getting rotated in a clockwise sense according to the shear sense of that shear zone. At the same time, the second set of National tension gashes form here in, uh, shown in blue, and this blue set now has the same geometry like the red set in its initial stage because now the blue set is formed according to the same mechanics. Mode 1 fractures propagating along sigma 1 and opening along sigma 3. They obviously might transect the older red set that has formed here in this first stage. And you can carry on with these processes and uh, form uh, another set, a green set here, now that uh, will transect the blue and the red set. The red set is now the largest. It also has shown the strongest kind of rotation uh, with uh, now something like 90 degrees rotation of the uh, central parts of the veins. The blue set is doing what the red set has been doing here in the second stage, and the green set is opening in the same way like the red and the blue sets in the previous stages of progressive strain in the same brittle shear zone. You will not always find several sets of national tension gashes transecting each other, but this is a feature that in a relatively high strain zone in the semi brittle environment Greenshears fasces most typically, uh, you might come across uh, quite regularly. It needs to be stressed that the stress field here, sigma 1 and sigma 3 orientations, remain constants throughout the evolution of such a shear zone. This is not so for the strain axis. If we had in the initial situation here the maximum shortening direction in this direction and the maximum stretch in that direction, you see they were parallel to the stress vectors in this situation. But uh, during progressive strain, the orientation of maximum stretch and maximum shortening have rotated according to the simple shear uh, vectors, simple shear processes in this, uh, in this shear zone, and that's how it looks like. So with progressive strain, the orientation of maximum stretch accumulated in the rock and maximum shortening accumulated in this rock uh, will have changed over time. We show that again. It is a top to the right, a clockwise rotation of the strain axis. And this is characteristic for non-coaxial flow for whatever is not pure shear. So any combination of pure and simple shear or simple shear without pure shear component. We are coming back to these distinctions in chapter 4. So summarizing national tension gashes, we find here that uh, shearing occurs in the brittle ductile transition and we initiate shearing with mode 1 hydraulic fracturing in uh, localized vein formation and these veins uh, form and propagate usually at high strain rate. The fracturing process can be very rapid as soon as the fluid pressure exceeds the shear strength of the rock. You might form such veins in seconds or even in milliseconds. So this is a high strain rate process, uh, whereas the ductile flow that happens in the background and that allows during the subsequent stages our initial tension gashes to rotate this is a low strain rate process, but it happens continuously. The propagation of tens tension gashes depends on the accumulation of fluid pressure, and that might be a periodic high strain rate process. Now the flow and the continuous bending of such initial tension gashes, uh, that is a good indicator for a low strain rate but continuous ductile process in the background. Let's come to shear sense indicators in the ductile field. There are a number of important shear sense indicators. Um, the 
most commonly used one are sigma and delta clasts. Also mica fish in uh, schistose rocks are a very uh, popular shear sense indicator. Wherever you might find uh, specifically feldspars, which are rigid, rigid clasts in a softer matrix, you might have fractured and offset porphyro clasts. And uh, this, again, you might argue is a semi-brittle behavior because you have a brittle fracturing, a brittle offset of certain particles in a ductile softer matrix. Then uh, modified foliations as C fabrics and shear bands, which also called C prime fabrics. Uh, this is uh, another class of shear sense indicators important in the ductile field, essentially in the ductile field, uh, which we will discuss briefly. The third important group of shear sense indicators are syntectonic porphyroblasts. These would be a helicytic inclusion trail that you already know from snowball garnets, but such inclusion trails can uh, form in many high shear strength mineral phases such as uh, staurolite, for instance. Also feldspar occasionally shows such inclusion trails. So it's not only restricted to garnets, also it's in garnet most commonly observed. Let's have a look at rotated porphyroclasts first. And here we have porphyroclasts such as uh, feldspar, for instance, that uh, undergo fracturing during shearing. And uh, this requires that we have a much softer matrix than uh, the uh, feldspar class. Feldspar, feldspar class would be the uh, rigid particle. And such a rheological contrast, as you know, is most commonly seen in most crustal, felsic crustal rocks in the upper green schist and lower to middle and fibrolite facies. Here we have a much higher shear strength of feldspar compared to an uh, already fairly ductile quartz in the matrix. Quartz is usually the rheologically most important phase in such, say, Nisic or meta gray rocks. Such fractured offset grains Rotated porphyroclasts we most commonly see in shear zones that are of uh, temperature between about 350 and 550 or 600 degrees Celsius. We see such rotated porphyroclasts formed most commonly by feldspar because feldspar has three very good cleavages which can be activated as slip plane. And uh, we, as we have seen, restrict the conditions of their formation to situation where the class is much more brittle and rheologically stronger than the softer matrix. We have two different types of displacement. Synthetic displacement that we see here on the right-hand side and antithetic displacement in, on the left-hand side. Synthetic displacement means that the displacement along these fracture planes along the cleavage planes of a feldspar has the same rotation sense, the same displacement sense, like the whole shear zone. That would be a synthetic offset. Antithetic displacement that we see here on the left-hand side, we see here a top, a top to the left sense of shear. And this top to the left is opposite to the overall shear sense of the shear zone. So how can that happen? What are the controlling factors that make a offset class either a synthetic one or an antithetic one? Here we see a photograph of a thin section with an antithetic offset here in this class and a series of synthetic offsets in this class here on the bottom, if you look carefully, you will see that the top fragments here have actually moved a little bit to the right-hand side. And the overall shear sense of this shear zone is also top to the right. This class here, relatively to the other fragment, clearly has moved to the left. So what is the most important controlling factor? For this, we need to investigate the uh, orientation of the stress field with respect to the shear zone. And in this example, the stress field most likely was orient oriented with the sigma 1 acting from the top left and the bottom right onto such a shear zone. This would introduce a top to the right overall sense of shear. And if you look carefully, these stress vectors, this is the maximum pushing force 
if you would apply such a force in this direction, acting on such a horizontal slip plane, in this case a cleavage plane in the uh, Feldstar fragment, then the top part would move to the right-hand side. If the cleavage plane is now oriented, like here, so with a steep inclination to the left-hand side dipping, then your stress vector would act on a very differently oriented slip plane and in this case force the hanging wall fragment downwards. This would force this uh, rotated porphyro class to develop as an antithetic one while this one is synthetic. Hence it's uh, essentially the angle between the mineral cleavage that is acting as a slip surface and the stress field that determines the syn or antithetic nature of a porphyroblast. So now this whole arrangement of uh, fragments in this case and also in that case as long as these fragments are touching each other, will rotate as a whole entity. And uh, that means that uh, this shear plane here, these sets of shear planes which are at the moment here antithetic, might rotate clockwise and at a certain stage come in, for instance, such an orientation. And then this antithetic class might become a synthetic one. Also this class here on the right hand side, this one will rotate in a clockwise sense determined by the overall uh, shear sense of the shear zone and that might eventually steepen these slip planes and at a certain stage this synthetic porphyro class might become an antithetic one once the slip surfaces are oriented in a suitable position to produce antithetic slip. Therefore, rotated porphyro clasts uh, should be examined not as a single feature. You should always compare a number of rotated porphyro clasts in your hand specimen, in the outcrop, or in the thin section. Don't make up your mind about the shear sense just from a single observation of a rotated porphyro clasp of offset fragments. Sigma and delta clasts. These are probably the most commonly known shear sense indicators for the inductile field and they again occur in rocks where you have rigid markers such as feldspars in a softer matrix and uh, uh, the classical example uh, of a rock where such shear sense indicators can develop are augenices, so porphyritic granitic material sheared in the ductile field is very likely to develop sigma and or delta class. Here we see how they look like. A sigma class here on top will have a relatively hard core, which is only in textbooks perfectly round, but uh, you might have a clearly harder particle in a softer matrix, and we are developing fairly thick wings on the top right and the bottom left end of such a porphyro class, provided that the overall shear sense is top to the right. This is just the other way around. If you have a top to the left sense of shear, uh, such a wing like we see here would develop up here the top left hand part or in the bottom right hand part of uh, the class. However, let's stick with this example top to the right and uh, here we see our large and thick wings of recrystallized material uh, from this um, main class, from this uh, feldspar class, for instance, also a garnet might do that. And this can be material that actually comes from this class itself, and a deformed large porphyro class has been replaced by such a wing shaped arrangement of recrystallized, strain free um, material from this very class that has uh, undergone plastic deformation. More often, in fact, you find that this is not recrystallized material, it is material precipitated from a fluid phase that forms in the uh, protectors, strain shadows of these large porphyro clouds in such a wing shape, in such a uh, sigma shape. This is a sigma type geometry. This looks different from these delta class. When you compare these two class, you will see that the wings that 
form here in the, uh, around the delta class are much longer and much thinner. And as a feature that is missing in the sigma class, we find here these deep gaps, that such embayments on this part and on this part of the class. The adhesion point where such thin wings of recrystallized or precipitated material will start, they are over here and over there in a fairly advanced stage of strain in a delta class. Important are these embayments here. They are the distinguishing feature other than the thickness of the wings uh, from sigma clasts. So if we have here a uh, shear sense indicated by the sigma class, you can just use the pointy ends of the wings here on the top right. We see the uh, pointy end of the wing uh, and you just draw an arrow along in this direction and you also draw an arrow on this wing here and you have your shear sense. This is how you indicate the shear sense from a sigma class. In a delta class, you could point arrows in the pointy, in these angular embayments, and also that would give you the rotation sense. This would give a rotation sense also of clockwise uh, rotation, and the same like up here. The geometry, however, is different. Here we see a sigma class. Uh, here we see these characteristic thick wings that uh, fizzle out a little bit in the matrix here. And here on the top right, we see also uh, this fairly thick wing of our sigma class. And um, you might uh, obviously determine the shear sense in this shear zone as a top to the right. So here we now see a delta class indicated by these two typical embayments that we see here indicating a top to the right rotation sense and nearby we see a sigma class. So how can two such so different classes develop in such close proximity to each other? This is a function of the recrystallization rate shown here as a capital R versus the rotation rate of the class. So if we look at the conditions that lead to the formation of a sigma class, we will observe a high recrystallization or precipitation rate in the wings. So we form thicker wings with uh, more volume compared to the size of the class. And we will see that there is a relatively low rotation rate associated with the formation of sigma class. This will produce large wings, but little wrapping and uh, rotating of these adhesion points, as we would see in the delta class. In the delta class, we will have a relatively low recrystallization or precipitation rate compared to the much faster rotation of our class. And this produces uh, thin wings that are wrapped around the developing delta class. That keeps the uh, wings here relatively thin, but stretched and rotated and wrapped around such a developing fast rotating class. So now if we have a recrystallization and rotation rate as important factors, how can we have the sigma class, which actually recrystallizes fairly fast or has a high precipitation rate and a lower rotation rate so close to a fast rotating delta class as we see here. These are only a few microns apart from each other, developing in the same shear zone, indicating the same sense of shear. In order to understand that, we need a little bit uh, deeper look into what is called continuum mechanics. And we are getting uh, some kind of uh, um, impression of what continuum mechanics actually is doing. We cannot go very deep into that matter, but uh, I hope you are getting the zest of it. Let's have a look at a simple shear flow in a shear zone. The shear zone is oriented horizontally. And here we see some uh, particle movement illustrated by vectors. So a particle that at the beginning of the deformation uh, is located at the uh, beginning of this arrow here would have moved during a certain time of uh, deformation, a 
uh, accumulating progressively strain would have moved to the tip of the arrow. And that is true for all particles that I illustrated at the arrow here. So at the top of the shear zone, we would have a move movement of particles to the right-hand side. And here we would have movement of particles to the left-hand side. That gives you that overall top to the right, bottom to the left sense of shear. Here, this uh, funny wheel on the left-hand side uh, indicates or illustrates uh, similar things in a slightly different way. What we have done here is simply connecting marker particles in such a rock. So a marker particle over here, a marker particle down here, and one here, there, in a systematic way until we get marker lines that are connecting specific marker points in a rock during progressive deformation. And what happens is that we get a certain behavior of these lines in terms of rotation and stretching or shortening that can be monitored for specific orientation around the uh, compass rolls here, if you like. So if uh, two marker particles that are connected uh, located are located here and there, we would see that during progressive strain, uh, such a marker line in a snapshot of the deformation process would undergo shortening. So that means uh, right at a increment of time in during deformation, such a marker line would experience shortening while it is rotated in a clockwise set. So let's have a look at this one. This marker rotates and it rotates fairly fast. Look at the length of this arrow here. That would illustrate the angular velocity, how fast such a marker line would rotate. And it also would shorten quite fast because the arrow that indicates shortening here is, uh, uh, is also fairly long. All this comes from experimental data. This can be shown in uh, analog experiments where you actually can uh, highlight such marker points and observe the uh, behavior and the motion of such marker points over time. So if you have a uh, connection line, such a marker line, in, uh, orientation of the blue line, then we would observe fast rotation and fast rotation. If our marker line is oriented here parallel to the green one, the marker will also rotate fast, indicated here by the long arrow, also in a clockwise sense, but it would undergo stretching. And also this stretching would be at a fairly fast rate, indicated by the length of these vectors that indicate shortening or, um, or stretching in this case. Here now, this uh, brown marker line would rotate much more slowly. You see here, the uh, clockwise rotation has slowed down. So as soon as a marker has rotated from here at a fairly fast rate, going even faster over here, faster here, slowing down slowly here, it comes to a very slow rotation velocity. And uh, the marker line is still undergoing stretching, but not at such a high rate like markers oriented in this direction. If we now look at the red marker here, we see that it is right between these two markers where the one is stretching and the other one is shortening. And we see that we have a gradual slowdown in uh, angular velocity. And this means that markers oriented in this orientation here neither do rotate nor do they stretch or shorten. This would be a orientation where markers stop rotating and remain constant in length. This is what we call the fabric attractor. The fabric attractor is the orientation to which all markers, which means all crystals, want to rotate with their long axis. And the equivalent structure in rocks would be the main foliation, more precisely the orientation of the stretching lineation on such a main fol foliation. During progressive simple shear, all markers tend to rotate in that orientation and this way pronounce and enhance the visibility and prominence of such a main foliation. So this now explains why we would have a 
sigma class and a delta class. The delta class rotating fast relatively to the recrystallization or precipitation rate and a sigma class that rotates much slower relatively to the recrystallization or precipitation uh, rate of material in the wings. So this sigma class perhaps started as a class oriented here like the dotted line and it has rotated only uh, very slowly and a little bit towards the orientation in which it then came to a stop when the shear zone stopped shearing. Whereas this um, delta class, for instance, might have started with this long axis much further away and had a much longer rotation way until it came into the orientation that we see now here. And that uh, probably happened at a higher velocity. Here we see an illustration comparing the evolution of sigma delta clasts and a third type, the phi clasts, in a slightly different uh, context, but uh, also shows us progressively how delta and sigma clasts evolve. What we see here is the illustration of a hard particle and a mantle around such a particle, which is softer. This could be a soft material surrounding this uh, clast. It also could be the rim of an initially larger clast that is prone to undergo recrystallization under the given uh, deformation temperature and conditions. So here we distinguish a hard part in the core and a uh, softer part in the periphery of such a clast. And this uh, distribution of hard and softer material is different in this column and in that column. Let's see what an effect that has on the uh, shape of the shear zone indicator that develops during progressive strain. If we have very little material that is prone to form wings because there is little uh, soft material available, then we will have during progressive strain, and now it's top to the left-hand side, in the first stage, something like a sigma class. So here, a sigma class starts to develop thick wings on the top left and on the bottom right hand side. But with increasing strain and rotation, we will see that this material is getting distributed, redistributed, and stretched out into fairly thin wings while these wing, wings are getting wrapped around the rotating core of the evolving delta class, which is completed here at the bottom. Thin wings, typical embayments, forming here in these two areas, indicating top to the left center of shear. If we have abundant material that uh, can be moved into recrystallized or re-precipitated wings, we will see that we have here a very similar geometry, even wider wings and a thicker mantle of soft material, re-precipitated or recrystallized material that uh, looks very similar like here for the delta class at that stage, of course we have a smaller hard competent core. And these wings are getting stretched out and flattened and they rotate slowly towards the fabric attractor. The fabric attractor would be horizontal. You see that here. And in the end we will have a kind of an orthorhombic geometry with a mirror axis here and a mirror axis there. And uh, this is when we have converted our sigma class in this and that stage into a phi class. You see here, again, thin mantle, low recrystallization rate would form a sigma class at the early stage, a delta class with progressive rotation. Here we have lots of mantle material, a high recrystallization rate of this uh, soft material would uh, be required to produce such large amounts of recrystallized material compared to the competent core. The sigma class evolves from an early stage to a more advanced stage. And finally, the phi class uh, has then produced such an orthorhombic geometry with progressive rotation and strain. And it's important, phi class are useless as shear sense indicators because they do not show an upper and a lower stair-stepping side like delta class or uh, sigma class, and we are not 
able to deduce the sense of shear from pi class. So stay away from them, but normally in all shear zones, like ductile shear zones, you will probably be lucky and find, uh, even if you have a majority of pi class, the odd sigma class or perhaps delta class nearby because of the variability of rotation rates in such shear zones. Mica fish. Mica fish are also commonly used as shear sense indicators and they have a lot of similarity with, uh, with sigma and delta classes due to the uh, very good cleavage in such uh, micas, you also find similarities with offset porphyro class like the feldspars that we have been looking at earlier. For instance, this mica fish here on the top left hand side looks pretty much the same like a sigma class. This would look like a phi class, uh, almost like it. You probably will not use this as a shear sense indicator. An antithetic fragment with antithetic displacement along the cleavage plane. And you see that relatively to the shear zone, the cleavage of these micas here are different compared to this or that mica, or certainly to this here, which would look like a synthetic offset class. This is also a synthetic fragment, but uh, now we have uh, the cleavage orientation differently, and we shear perpendicular to the cleavage plane. And we have thin trains of uh, recrystallized mica here connecting these two particles, indicating that they once belong to the same crystal. So the group uh, of the examples F to I are more complex geometries. And uh, you will come across such shear sense indicators, such mica fish. But uh, they should be used with uh, care. And, and very often you find in the same rock, in the same shear zone, these simpler ones that, uh, that you see here on top. Here are a few examples on thin section. Here we see a mica fish with uh, slightly bent wings that uh, are over here. You also see under the extinction in this area that tells you that this is a porphyro class. This is a crystal that was there before and got deformed during deformation. And uh, this mica fish would be some kind of hybrid between the example A and the example G, uh, where you see some shearing here of the top parts to the right hand side. Uh, here we see uh, classical examples of uh, type A mica fish. They are, in fact, the most common ones. If you want to read more about the evolution of mica fish in myelonitic rocks, there is a uh, paper in Tectonophysics from 2003. Uh, by a Dutch group. The Dutch have done a lot of research into shear sense indicators. Let's now come to syntectonic porphyroblasts. These would be crystals that are growing while they are being rotated in a ductile shear zone. A syntectonic growth of minerals will produce spiral sigmoidal trains of inclusion, inclusions overgrown in the matrix in such a rigid host mineral. That is what we call a helicytic texture, or snowball garnet, or starolite. Normally, people do not talk about snowball starolite. They would uh, then talk about helicytic inclusion trains in starolite. You can find the same also in andalusite. You find it in uh, albitic porphyroblasts at low temperature ranges. Uh, feldspars might do it. But most commonly, yes, they will be observed in garnet and starolite. Here we see such sigmoidal inclusion trains. And uh, you must be careful interpreting them when comparing them to sigma class or delta class. We will see that in a minute. Here we see how syntectonic porphyroblasts evolve over time. Let's assume you have a shear zone, a ductile shear zone, with a already developed uh, foliation defined by fine-grained micas, for instance. And in this foliation, during tectonic displacement, you start growing garnet by a metamorphic reaction. The first garnet that grows in uh, its uh, future core will overgrow the matrix minerals, these little micas here, as they are oriented at that time. And uh, they will get preserved in the hard garnet material. If this garnet, while it is increasing in size during growth, will get rotated passively by uh, simple shear, 
you will see that the earliest inclusions captured in this and in that stage will get passively rotated in an orientation oblique to the orientation of the um, myelonitin matrix. Now the uh, mica in the matrix still will remain in the orientation of the fabric attractor. The internal micas, the internal foliation preserved in the garnet, will progressively rotate to the left-hand side, will lean to the left if your shear sense in the uh, shear zone is top to the left. And this can continuously uh, lead to a curving pattern of inclusion trails because what is getting captured at the growing rim of the garnet always will capture the orientation of the micas as they are in the matrix at the moment of capturing in the crystal material of the growing garnet or staurolite. Progressively, this will show this S-shape type and uh, very often you will find that the rims of garnet then grow post-kinematically and statically and often are devoid of um, inclusions. This makes it a bit equivocal because you are not you cannot be sure that this uh, inclusion pattern that you find here in the core of such a garnet once actually was connected to this shear zone. This shear zone easily could be a much younger feature than the shear zone that was once captured in the interior of such a garnet. So make sure that you always have a connection between the internal foliation, the inclusion trains, and the matrix foliation uh, outside of the porphyroblast. Another pitfall in the interpretation of such inclusion trains is just taking them by geometry in a similar way like sigma clasts. For instance, when you see a sigma clasts, you have here this kind of curving geometry. And uh, sometimes it's even exaggerated and produces something like this here. This is very similar to the inclusion trains in a snowball garnet. So look here. This often is mistaken and misinterpreted as a uh, sigma geometry, which then would indicate a top to the right sense of shear. But here it is important to recognize that the garnet is a syntectonic mineral that captures the external foliation progressively while being rotated. This is very different from a pre-existing class that is experiencing the whole deformation episode, the whole deformation process, and develops then a sigma-shaped geometry. So don't mix up the uh, porphyroblasts and the porphyroblasts when you are dealing with shear sense indication. So the next large group of shear sense indicators are modified foliations, and these shear sense, sense indicators as C fabrics and C and C prime shear bands. You will look out for in all rocks that do not have hard particles like uh, those that are commonly developing either sigma or delta clasts or syntectonic porphyroblasts like uh, snowball garnets or starolites. In uh, schistose rocks or also in these uh, quartzites that we see here on the right hand side, you will look out for SC fabrics and for C prime shear. SC fabrics, as the name suggests, consist of S planes and C planes, uh, shown here in yellow and in blue. And uh, these are two sets of shear planes that develop at the same time. It is not an overprinting uh, relationship. And uh, you can see that the S planes and the C planes are merging into the orientation of the C planes. So the S planes are curving and then um, join the C planes without actually transecting them. That is a very important feature of SC fabrics. The C planes, as we see here, uh, normally form the boundary of the shear zone. The S planes are in between the C planes and uh, curve into them in, uh, and often have such a sigmoidal shape that we very often see in uh, shear sense indicators and in shear fabrics. Yes, S and C planes are co-genetic. They form at the same time. They are not the documentation of two deformation events. 
It is important to see SC fabrics in their three-dimensional context that also applies to uh, sigma class and delta class and uh, snowball garnets. So we haven't discussed that yet, but here we see the context of shear sense indicators with their three-dimensional continuation. Uh, look at these S planes and C planes that we see only as traces here on the front of our block. They continue in the third dimension as uh, planar surfaces. The S planes here parallel to the top and the bottom of this block. The S planes are slightly oblique to them, but also these are three dimensional features. On the top of such blocks, we would have transport lineations, uh, slicken lines or stretching lineations. More commonly, because this is a semi ductile or ductile pattern. Uh, in most cases, also you find SC fabrics also in the Ripple field, specifically in the Cape Port Belt. So here it is important to look for SC fabrics only in a very specific surface, in the surface that is perpendicular to these shear planes, which are the top and the bottom of the block, and parallel to the transport lineation that you find on the C plane. So if you look in the outcrop in the field, you always should try to get a three-dimensional cut where you actually can see the continuation of such C planes of which we see here only the trace in the third dimension. And on such a plane, you must look out for the transport lineation. Only if the transport lineation is parallel to the section that you are looking at, you can use this for shear sense indication. That is very, very important. The typical procedure would always be find the shear plane, determine the orientation of the transport lineation on that shear plane, then find a surface that is parallel to the lineation and perpendicular to the shear plane. That would be, for instance, the front of this block here. Then check, and only there you check for shear sense indicators. Don't go to the field and say, oh, I see an SC fabric, and I indicate the shear sense. And only then I actually bother whether what I am looking at here is really developed on the right section. You must find the good sections first. And that requires finding the shear plane and the transport lineation on them. This section that we are looking at, the front of this block is what we call the XZ plane of strain. This is an old nomenclature that uh, by tradition has survived. And uh, XZ is uh, commonly now referred to as in terms of S1 and S3, being the principal uh, strain axis in that uh, described the strain ellipsoid. So what you have to do, you have to find this X Z plane, the plane where you find maximum and minimum stretch. And you do that by investigating in this sequence of checks. Features that you see on other sections, for instance, here on this side of such a block, uh, they might look like SC fabrics or any kind of other shear sense indicators. Sometimes you get geometries that you could interpret in that way. But they are meaningless as shear sense indicators. Do not look at them. They will give you wrong information. They are not meaningful tools to determine the tectonic history of uh, such a shear zone and of such a region in context of many observations. This principle is valid for all shear sense indicators other than slick and side steps. For the slick and side steps, you obviously have to look onto the fault surface in order to find these steps. But everything else, all other shear sense indicators, are only examined on the XZ plane of strain. And for this, you need to adhere to the steps A, B, C, and D. Let's talk about reverse and normal C prime shear bands. We have talked about the C fabrics. Now let's talk about the shear bands. And obviously also the right surface needs to be uh, examined for uh, the uh, interpretation of C prime shear bands. That means, again, a section parallel to the transport lineation perpendicular to the shear plane needs to be looked at. And here you often will find 
geometries that look like this here. Here you now have the C planes and you see transecting them at high angle, usually at high angle with respect to the boundaries of the shear zones, these C prime secondary shear planes. And these shear planes also indicate the sense of shear and you can determine the sense of shear by the dragging of the C planes into the C prime planes. So if you have here a block on top of such a C prime plane and it slides downwards, you will find a bending up of the shear plane in this direction that you see here. And the small block below such a C prime plane will be bent downwards while you move the hanging wall block uh, down along the C prime plane. All this can happen at micro scale. Sometimes you see it at mesoscale with hand lens or even with the naked eye. But uh, overall, this feature is independent of scale. So out of these, in the group of the C prime shear bands, there are two types. One is the so-called reverse granulation. The other one is the normal granulation, uh, C prime fabric shear band. Also, extensional granulation cleavage has been used to describe these standard type of shear bands. Let's see how the normal shear bands evolve. Um, and uh, there are a number of explanations. Uh, the one that I like most uh, would be the situation before or at the onset of shearing or during progressive strain in such a shear zone. If you have in such a shear zone a main foliation that has a slight antithetic dip, so a dip away from the overall shear sense vectors, uh, like it is seen here, you might develop secondary fracture planes, secondary shear planes, uh, roughly parallel to the sigma 1 direction. Sigma 1 in such a situation, a top to the right shear zone, would point from top left to bottom right, or from bottom right to top left, the opposite vector. And uh, here you would have then these antithetically oriented shear planes that get transected by C prime planes roughly parallel to sigma 1. The overall shear sense in such a shear zone, top to the right, would force a displacement along these secondary shear planes, the C prime planes, also in a top to the right sense of shear. This is what we call a shear band, a C prime fabric, or a normal granulation. All these terms are valid for this structure. The reverse granulation now is uh, slightly different. Here we would have a part of the shear zone where the uh, main foliation is dipping a little bit in a synthetic direction compared to the boundaries of the shear zone. In our example here, that would be a minor dip to the right-hand side. And here we would form something like micro thrusts. We see that here and here magnified in this situation. These micro thrusts are roughly at uh, 30 degrees with respect to sigma 1. And uh, they, they could be interpreted as uh, an equivalent of the larger scale thrust features that you, that you know. If you form such small scale shear zones, you will form a dragging feature. And if displacement is very small, you just will fold a little bit your main foliation. This will be an asymmetric fold, uh, as we know it from uh, granulation cleavage, for instance. And uh, this geometry also indicates the sense of shear. The long, short, long geometry of such uh, folds is useful as a shear sense indicator. Very often, you find a little fracture cutting through the limbs of such microfolds. The geometry of such microfolds is very similar to what we have been talking about in the last course. Imbricate fans with blind, blind thrusts are very similar to the uh, small scale fractures associated with uh, narrow folds, with uh, tight folds, asymmetric folds, uh, as we see here. Here is such an imbricate fan 
these are fairly angular folds that we see here and the uh, fold planes are uh, ending here along these limbs. You see the similarity in geometry between the microscale feature and the macroscale feature. There are a number of pitfalls associated with shear sense indication and we already have talked about the difficulty and the necessity to choose the right surface here. This is another example that illustrates this, uh, this difficulty and uh, the necessity to actually carefully select the right surface to uh, look for shear sense indicators. When we look here at this block, we have an oblique transport direction. You see here this gray surface. This is our shear plane, our main shear plane, and the stretching lineation on the shear plane is associated with a transport parallel along that lineation. The right-hand block moves up, the left-hand block moves down, but there is also a uh, lateral shear sense associated with it, which is a dextral strike slip. We have a dextral strike slip component, and we have a um, vertical component of strain, which moves the left-hand side block down and the right-hand side block up. In combination, these two constitute oblique slip. If we now are careless geologists and we uh, just look at this marker horizon here and we look at the front of this, um, of this block, we might see that here this marker horizon is actually curving and bending down into a high strain zone and people would say, oh, this is just a normal fault with the left-hand block going down and they are missing out on the dextral strike slip component. On the other hand, if you have a section cut through this block by erosion, for instance, this is on, which is on this level here, you might find in plan view such a geometry. And here you see the dragging also of a marker horizon into the shear zone, and you only might see the uh, sinistral strike slip component missing out on the vertical component of oblique slip. Even worse, you will indicate here the wrong sense of strike slip. You will think here this is sinistral. The truth is you have a dextral strike slip component. So what is important is you, that you always look at the right kind of surface through your marker line or other shear sense indicators and choose a surface in the field that is parallel to the transport lineation and perpendicular to the foliation to the shear planes. Only then you can rely on shear sense indicators that you see looking at such a surface as shaded in brown color here. This is very, very important. This is the most commonly made mistake in kinematic interpretation of deformed terrains, particularly in the ductile field, but also in the brittle field. Here are more pitfalls that illustrate a very similar situation. Uh, here we see a uh, set of blocks, two examples, uh, where the real situation is illustrated under A. You see here a fault is transacting a sequence of tilted layers. And uh, clearly here we are dealing with a normal fault. This is a normal fault that offsets the right-hand block with respect to the left-hand block. The lineations here on the fold surface indicate this uh, transport direction. If you now have a situation where after such a displacement, the top part of the left-hand block is leveled out by erosion, you might find, due to the inclined nature of your marker horizons, such a plan view on your map. And uh, careless uh, geologists might just look at the sequence of layers and see here the geological boundary between the dark gray and the light gray and then the black layers uh, repeated here on this side with dark gray, light gray, and black. And they will say, oh, very clear, this is a sinistral strike slip fault. But this is not true. These geologists are not taking into account the tilted geometry of these blocks. And they are not bothering to look at the fault surface. That is what you have to do to discriminate between this wrong shear sense of sinistral strike slip uh, 
as to the uh, correct interpretation of normal faulting uh, with the right hand block moving downwards. Similarly here, here now we have a indeed left-handed or sinistral strike slip offset along a fault cross cutting this sequence and uh, if we would look in a quarry at uh, such a surface and take out this front block here we might look at such a situation and again careless geologists might actually uh, just look at the black and the light gray uh, layer and think this is a good marker layer this is offset here to the right hand side and misinterpret this fold as a uh, normal fold with a right hand block moving downwards which is not true as we can see here. It's a geometric effect of tilted layers that are transected by steep folds. So wherever you want to indicate the shear sense during kinematic interpretation of uh, a deformed terrain you must clearly have a look at the surface of faults in the brittle field. You must get a three-dimensional attitude for all markers that you want to use and you have to use the XZ section of strain for all shear sense indicators other than slick and side steps. Please keep that in mind. Incorrect appearance shear sense, uh, that is the most commonly made mistake by field geologists who attempt to be structural geologists. And never determine the fault type or the shear sense without examining the fault surface, the transport lineations, and ideally slick and side steps if you are working in the brittle field. I want again to revisit the routine steps for shear sense indication and that is a very important thing. You all should be very well aware how to do that and you should be able to explain that. If you are looking for the uh, shear sense in uh, narrow shear zones or faults, you first find the shear plane, make sure that you know its orientation, you examine the surface of this shear plane to find the transport direction. These can be stretching lineations, these can be uh, slick and side steps uh, or, or slick and lines uh, for, for those faults that formed in the brittle field. In the ductile field you then determine the orientation of the XZ plane of strain and there you are looking for shear sense indicators and the XZ plane is always parallel to the lineation and perpendicular to the shear plane surface. And there is only one such surface that matches these criteria. That is where you look for shear sense indicators and nowhere else. Thank you very much.